Boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about artificial intelligence applications and so much more. We have Chip Hui and joining us on the show. Hello. Hey. Hey. Thanks for coming on. Yes, I'm super excited. Likewise, yeah. super pumped for this. I'm so grateful that we we've I ran into your beautiful world word clouds that you were yeah. showcasing on your Twitter profile and on your website and I was like these are really profound and I'm excited to share them they give us really good insights and so mm. we'll be getting to that during the episode I'm pumped for that for those that don't know Chip Williams background she's an applied research engineer who created the TensorFlow course at Stanford, a four times Vietnamese best-selling author, and works a lot with data. And you can find huyenship.com, link in the bio, as well as the Twitter profile, which is Oh my God, Chip. I sound amazing in the words. Like, it should just be my official introducer where I go somewhere, something. <laughs> Hype man! <laughs> Hype man for Chip, oh, yeah. always. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah. we've got to get people excited because you're very important to share what you're doing in, with the world, and that's okay. why you're here with us. Yep. Let's start things off by asking you, what are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Man, that's such a like big question. Um, so, so actually, it's so funny. Like when I was on my lift here, I was talking to the driver too, to the driver about this, and he was like, people keep calling about how bad things have been. But actually, he's like he's like in his sixties, right? He's like, actually, it was a lot worse before. So like, there are a lot of bad things happening, but like overall, I look into the overall progress, like things are getting better over time. So I think like the world is getting better. Yeah, yeah. I, a lot of people say that the world is getting better across so many different domains, and it's very true. Yeah. And in other regards, um, the complexity of our exponential technology and our geopolitics are, and our spiritual wisdom is not really caught up to that. And so, yeah, what do you think about that? I'm actually worried. Um, so like, we look like so a lot of a lot of scientific advances are like to really truly help everyone. So in you know, the like vaccine, antibiotics. But like even look at historical evidence, it has shown that usually people who hold the right technologies have an edge over, or they can use the technologies against those who don't. It look like on slavery, uh, colonization, it's just people with big ship with like gun power can like overpower other countries. So actually I'm really worried about it because I still have a feel of like, so I'm from Vietnam, a very tiny country, and um, people in Vietnam don't, a lot of people don't, still don't know like, what, what AI is about. I said, no, it's a, it's a hype word, everyone's talking about it, but like, what, what is it about? Um, whereas um, people here, everyone knows what it is, and everyone is like, trying to use it for business. I'm just really worried um, at one day, but then um, AI is gonna, all like technology in general, and I'll make the gap even more, even bigger. Since so Vietnam, of countries in Vietnam, we have no chance of like competing, like both commercially or militarily with other, with, with more developed countries when the gap gets bigger. Yeah, the network effect is so strong and the United States and China and the other leaders in mm -hmm. the field are potentially going to uh, take off at faster rates with yeah. the technology. And then how do we uh, make sure that it's, um, It's a very difficult thing to figure out, and we gotta have humanity. I think it's good. It's good that people are, are looking into it. We own the air safety, um, regula uh, regularization. Um, it's just that a lot of it is still very Western centric. So I think I would love to see more like diverse voice in how to make AI not really safe for, not really beneficial to, uh, to only people in the developed nations, but also like truly beneficial to everyone as well. Yeah. yeah. There's moralities and philosophies and ethical codes from around the world and other countries that could be applied to the way that the West and the way that China is making AI. Mm. Um, yeah, to make it be inclusive AI and, and sharing the pie growth, not just with making trillionaires, but with... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. China to make it a zero-sum game. It's gonna be good. Why do you say that? Oh, it's like when you have... Uh, so like when you have two countries and one more advanced than the other, then the more advanced will take advantage of the less advanced one. 
and it's going to be a zero-sum game. So is there a way to make it not a zero-sum zero sum game? Zero-sum game, yeah. Yeah. Yeah it's, the, yeah, it's so important to always make it a positive-sum game and to also share um, the... I mean, just something as simple as we all reside on this planet. Actually, I'm interested to hear what you think about this. Do you feel like a lot of the issues that we have in our world are because of our disconnection from nature, from source, from what sustains us? Well, uh, I haven't really spent a lot of time on it. Um, I think one thing that I see here is that um, a lot of problems people work on are actually not problems. As they have very incremental privileges. So somehow mm. people here are trying to work on things to make their life easier and shy away from problems that can truly help a lot of people in the rest of the world. First of all, like uh, almost one billion people still don't have access to electricity. So that's a real problem. Nobody's like not people here. The number is one billion. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I believe that's also how many don't have access to clean water. It's eight hundred yes. million or something like that. Yeah. 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 So like a lot of it's, it's somehow um, yeah I think it's. it's those are real know, problems, yeah. not incremental privileges, which is yes. what you said, yeah. Yeah, I know. So, like, for example, of um, the blockchain technology, is something I'm really excited about. Okay, um, um, I don't, I don't invest in cryptocurrency, just to be <laughs> as a disclaimer. Um, it's just, it's just like a lot of arguments on the cryptocurrency. People are like, oh, hey, cryptocurrency it should help people who don't ha have access to the world financial system to actually enjoy the world financial system because like some people like many people live too far from commercial center so they don't have access to like they have a bank account and the bank cannot serve them so they think cryptocurrencies can help it can help them and then they look at all the cryptocurrencies companies they are own based in a bay area in berlin so like if you really want to help those people who have no access to banking system then why are you based here why are you not based in like ethiopia or something so that's mm. yeah yeah, it's int interesting, and then also, yeah, like you're you're almost describing like this idea of like a, a virtue signal in a sense of wanting to yeah showcase that you're doing something for the world when it's just an, an incremental privilege in some ways. Yeah. But people also come to places like the Bay Area or Shenzhen or Berlin and places because of the network effect too that they can uh, surround themselves with other really you know big technical leads like yourself. I wouldn't call myself. A you big are. Lead. You are, and you know to. You, you, when you're here, you get to surround yourself with people like you. But if you're, you know, you, it's hard to find someone that knows about TensorFlow in Ethiopia. You know, these yeah. types of things. So I think there have been a lot of um, there have been a lot of progresses in like training, um, just because of the availability of courses online. So I think people like a lot of people in Ethiopia have access to TensorFlow yeah, courses. Online is yes. huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like this um, interesting. I think it's a good thing like to surround yourself with people who like always working on problems and we're trying to like solve things uh, but there's also like uh, the same thing like when you surround yourself with people who think too much like you there's mm. a danger in it as well yeah 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 it's yeah it's in many ways become like that in the echo chambers that we've been split up into and then oh my god echo our chamber bubbles are preventing yeah. us from yeah hearing the yeah that's that's good that's a good, great point. Let's. You mentioned this. I want to. I want to um, see what we can discover from this. What was it like being born in a village southeast of Hanoi? What was that like growing up? Oh wow! Um, this is really funny. Some. It's really funny. So, I, I went to this dinner party, and this is lady. Um, she's like in her like seventy, and and she was like. Can you believe? So she was telling her story, like growing up, and she was like, she grew up in like some other country, and was like, can you believe that when I grew up, um, we had toilet with no running water? It was like just trash in a toilet. You and, and I was like, that's my generation story. So so it's really funny. It's like people yeah. think a lot of things is like unbelievable. Like sixty years ago, it's very applicable to my like. That's how, how I grew up. I grew up with like no flush toilet. Um, there's no TV. We had TV very late. I have access to the internet so very late. Um, we used to sleep on the floor and we had this like terrible fear. It's really silly. Um, I don't even understand this like what it's like to sleep on the floor because I, I grew up and I had this fear still of like having worm crawling yeah. into the ear. Why oh. you sleep? Oh. Yeah, so that's something you never have to worry about. Um, anyway, it's not it's not a terrible actually. 
um, it was very free. Like I didn't grow up like kids with like iPad. Yeah, it was very free. Yes, yeah, so I grew up like running barefoot uh, in the like rice paddies. Yeah. Yeah. Which very is free. free. Very, very, very free. free. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. It's it's hard to like explain. It's just very different. Like, everyone knew everyone. I guess it's true to every villagers. Um, yeah. It was it's somehow like my parents. It's hard for my parents to imagine the life I'm living right now because it's so different from the life they used to. So I think it's a good signal that that like I managed to like get out of it. But it also will be sad. And I think when I talk to my parents and my brothers, they can't relate to my life anymore. Yeah. And I was like really sad. I wish I could. I don't know. I so wish I could share more My God. with them. Yeah. Yeah, we just had another episode when when we were talking about one of our friends, um, Tom Osborne, who also went from a village in Kenya to Nairobi oh and then to Harvard. Who and, is that? And so and so he goes when he goes back to the village, he can't relate yeah. with the people in, in the village. Like, any what? Yeah. You have this very yes. I guess it's the same. I feel like. I think pretty much the same story to everyone going from a third world country to a very privileged bubble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Where we're making like incremental changes for privileged changes uh, yeah. versus solving real world problems. Yeah, that story about the woman that said that, oh, back in my day, we used to not have <laughs> the, the t toilets there. Yeah. Right? And you're like, we still don't when yeah. I grew up. Yeah. Yeah. Sleeping on like dirt floor. You know, when I was a kid, when you we, were a kid, we have like proper house now, so it's it's proper good. Proper house now, yeah. Yeah, and it was not. Yeah. So the thing is, like, it's so horrible. But the thing is, that, like, we really feel poor when we compare ourselves to other people. But we live in a village, and everyone is the same as us. Then it's just so like we don't feel poor. We just feel like oh, we're just normal. It's just how life is supposed to be, and yeah. it doesn't make it obsessed. Yes, yes. So I was talking about it with my friend. We we're walking like on just on South we see home homeless people. And my friends, and I was like, oh, homeless people make, make me feel really sad to see them like that. And my friend was like, I bet they have like better access to healthcare than their parents did when they were kids. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, but like my parents didn't have to compare themselves to other people they saw like driving by in a fancy car. Mm -hmm. But this homeless people do. Mm -hmm. And this is a comparison that makes, an, like, makes life even worse. So when you're kind of free running in the rice pet, rice fields and you have like the um, you have a, a hierarchy that's a little bit more like a hierarchy it's like more flattened um, mm -hmm. in like a in a, in a village yeah uh, versus when you start seeing cars and you see the immediate differences in cars and you see the immediate differences in people's yeah homes uh, and things like that then there's the co comparison mindset mm -hmm. which can be both extremely mentally taxing, but it can also be something that kind of motivates people to maybe strive for something, like strive for a purpose. Yeah. But I also totally resonate of just, you know, being with life and just being, just being alive versus needing to go and, you know, make money and, yeah. Yeah, it's a rat race. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you came oh. to the heart of that in mm. the heart of the productivity culture well yes it's really funny uh, but are we gonna get into Let's this like philosophical well, conversation well, well well why yeah i mean tell we'll tell yeah let's we'll get there in a little bit actually why don't you tell us about um how you picked up your interest because you have you founded free hugs vietnam <laughs> Provides volunteer opportunities for yeah. Vietnamese students to help improve English. You organize workshops, competitions, mm -hmm. speaker series, all these types of things. Yeah, well, how did you pick up these interests growing up and doing that? I'm a very impulsive person. A what person? Um, impulsive. Impu imp how does that? Like? Mm. I M P U L. Impulsive. Yes. Oh, an impulsive for you. What? Yes, I am. <laughs> like when I see something, like I have to do it. So, um, so it's usually like I'm not like a big planner. I don't plan to make my life years in advance. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so easily like I'm just like, huh, that looks like a reasonable thing to do. Let's just do it. So the free hugs thing, um, actually started when I was in high school, and I went to high school like far from home. 
um, and I was like, do you know when I was living with myself when it was like 14, 15? Was Did you go to like a, a high school that was of a, of a, like a higher a academic degree? Yes, yes. Which yeah. is kind of what, similarly with what Tom did in Kenya. Yeah. I think it's just usually like, I, I just think about like how people get out of their... I'm not, did you read this book? Um, uh, was this guy who has his theories that... Um, anyways, it doesn't matter, I'm just sort of going through this theory, but usually like, um, you have a different level of incomes and usually you can easily like, next generation is only move one step further mm. but there are some I feel like for my parents to me like it's like three steps and also like for this guy so easily for that there's only a very narrow niche way that it can happen easily through oh to jump that many yeah yeah there like income gap um, yeah so oh anyway um, so yes it was in high school and I, and I and it was sort of like getting sad and lonely and um, you know in, in Vietnam in Vietnam, people don't hug. People don't express the feelings. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> well, well, in many He's ways, a big hugger. I'm a big hugger. Yeah. And, oh my God, it and, would not yeah. have an outlet for it in Vietnam. No, I would need to sign up for free <laughs> hugs. It wasn't Vietnam. like hug yourself, yeah. <laughs> Just hug yourself. <laughs> well, sometimes that same thing happens in certain um, areas of the productivity culture. Is it's a, you know, it's a yeah. handshake, or instead of, uh, you know. More yeah. of a hug. Okay. You don't want to hug people because they might like sue you for sexual harassment. Just kidding. <laughs> that might happen to some people. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, oh wait, I shouldn't make a joke about that. This is uh, okay. This is so scary. Um, anyway, uh, so it was just like, where about like express the feelings more? Why didn't so yeah. I watched this video of this guy who was doing free hugs in Australia. Oh and yeah. That is such a cool concept. Let's just do it. So I wrote a blog post about it. And then it, it sort of went viral, and I was like, let's just do it. So we did that. So we just like got people together, and like we had this uh, free hugs campaign in Vietnam. And after that, I got like so many like contact from people, like mostly young people. And I feel like let's just do something with it. And everyone wanted to learn English back then. People like English education was not really like advanced, or was not um, yeah didn't really meet the need of the people. So like let's just use it like, to practice English, so like an English club. And then like, how about like, other soft skills? Um, okay, so with English, it was like things the important way things is like to uh, to have a practice. So we I realized a, a lot of NGOs coming to Vietnam need help with translation. So so I, I contact a lot of NGOs, foreign NGOs when they come to Vietnam and ask, hey, do you need volunteers? And then they yeah. match something like people yeah, yeah. to like students who can help them. That's, um, Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and. Not only increasing the amount of people that are willing to, you know, be vulnerable or have that deeper emotional connection via a hug and making yeah. that more popular, but also, um, yeah, it's when you're kind of like, you know, wherever your you know, your birthplace mm -hmm. is, and then if it's in a country that has yeah. a s smaller amount of like GDP or people, mm -hmm. and it's harder for them to negotiate with the bigger countries and stuff, it makes things uh, a, a different. It's a different, completely different essence in, in a village versus a, a metropolis, especially in a city like the Bay Area or, yeah, yeah versus maybe even Hanoi. Yeah, yeah, I haven't been, but I would. Have you not? not yeah. Really good food. Yeah. And yeah. great people. The food of the world, the people of the world, the cultures of the world, yeah. Yeah. This is important to be in love with. We yeah. love Tulan. Yeah, oh, a, so the a, a cave? Tulan on it's 6th Street. It's a oh, yeah. oh, Tulan. Yeah. It's a restaurant. Oh. It's <laughs> but, a restaurant. Then, but it's also a flower. Um, yeah. 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 You also name a cave. It's a cave too? Yes, it's oh. a big cave. Oh. We have one of the world's biggest cave. It's very big. You can oh. fit the enti entire Empire State, State Building. Building in the cave? Huh? In the cave, you could fit the whole Empire State Building? Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. It's so big, it has its own ecosystem inside. It's really yeah, cool. that's what's up. See, I want to check that. Yeah, see, these are cool things in the world to yeah go and explore and check. The world is like quite amazing. It's it's incredible. This whole place, you can't explore it all in a lifetime. No way, not even. Sure, you can. Place. With a ma all you need is like a big budget. I don't know. I feel like even then you couldn't even explore Vietnam in a lifetime. You couldn't explore mm. the U.S. in a lifetime. You can checklist. You can like go to on a checklist. You could yeah. do like 10 things in every country in a lifetime, mm. maybe, if, if you're lucky, you could get to that, yeah. 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 Okay, but then after that, this part was like, okay, so you went to Brunei for... 
three-day vacation, which turned into a three-year trip through Asia, Africa. I tell you, I'm a impulsive person. Like You're very not, this not a sense. good planner at all. Um, yeah. Uh, so it was like after high school, I was just like, I know what to do with my life. You know, um, I already started working in high school, and I was like, it's okay, it's possible to make money without going to college. And it was so disheartened by the by the education system in Vietnam, and it was like I, I don't want to go to school here. Mm. Sounds bad. There must be good courses in Vietnam. Um, anyway, so I was like, let's just like travel and see. So I went to Brunei for three days, and I had my return ticket. <laughs> but then I met this little girl who was like driving to like East Malaysia, and she was like, wanna come with me? It's like okay. So I went and like, oh wow, it's really easy to just like go from one country to the it's next. Yeah. So I was like, how about let's try to do it. Yeah. So I was like, let's try to like go from one country to the next and see how far I can go. So it's the worst case is when I like get a flight ticket back home. And I just kept on doing it for three years. It just kept happening? People would just bring you No, it's like and hitchhiking that's... and uh, yeah. I can buy a bus ticket. Uh, bus ticket sometimes I have to fly because I'm yeah. foreign country. When I run out of money, I'm, I pick up some of my odd jobs on the road. Wow, for yeah. three years, yeah. Yeah, Where'd I you... was a true nomad. Where did you go after the uh, East Malaysia? Um, I was like around in like Southeast Asia. Yeah. Like on Thailand, Singapore. And okay. like, um, yeah, and then and then I went to uh, India, Nepal. Of course, cool. I cannot not yeah. go there. <laughs> yeah. Like searching for myself. Um, no, I was not searching for myself. I was just like, yeah. it's on the way. But you didn't know your life purpose, then. huh? I did not. Yeah. I know. I went to college with like people so much younger than me, and they seemed to know exactly what they wanted to do with their life, and I, I had no idea what you I wanted to do with my life. To, you went to Africa after India, and Nepal, then. Yeah, yeah. So spent some time there, and then spent some in Israel and Palestine. Okay. I spent three months in Israel. Oh yeah. So much fun. Yeah. Um, and so Palestine as well. Um, yeah. It's really sad what's happening there. The conflict. Um, they got shot at in Palestine. You. Got what shot happened? Got what shot did I hear? Shot at. You, you were shot at yes. in Palestine. And then, and then I pick up some like ammunition shell, just like as a um, souvenir. Souvenir. <laughs> reminding myself that like life is precarious. Yeah. Um, then I went to Africa. Yeah. I spent most of a year in Africa. Um, and then I went. Where did you go in Africa? Oh, uh, it's just like along the east, um, the east coast. Yeah. Yeah. So like so Tanzania, uh, like yeah. so like Ethiopia, Kenya, cool. Tanzania. Wow. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Those are beautiful places. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It is. It's very different life. Yeah. Uh, it's a very different way of life. Um, Do you feel safe amongst the whole period of travel? It's funny, I felt so much more safe in Africa than here. In the United States? Yes. Whoa. I hitchhike for a year in Africa, it's fine. I try to hitchhike in, um, uh, near Albuquerque and I almost got kidnapped. Oh, whoa. Yes, yeah. it's not, I don't, yeah, it's actually oh, wow. weird. I feel, I felt so much more safe there. That's interesting, yeah. 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 Okay, and so then after this three year South period Ameri of tra yeah. travel, yeah, South America then? Yeah. After that? Whoa. And then college. Where'd you go in South America? Uh, I traveled slowly. slowly. So, like yeah. um, Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, they own very big countries. So. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And you felt good there, interesting. It was all like just very mind expanding, the whole, this whole process. <laughs> three years of um, it. It got old. It did. It got old. Yeah, you wanted like, to, like yeah. yeah. I saw people like who travel for like ten years. I met so many people who just like travel for their for their for their life, like for the entire life. Whoa. Um, I met a lot of like um, we call them like just like babies. So like people who travel and then have babies. So these those babies is like grow up on the road. On the road. Yeah, it's really incredible. Like we go camping because most of the time in in South America, I sp we spend more of our time as like camping uh, as a camp. And for me, like. It's exciting, but then I saw just like babies, like one year old, two years old, and just all the lives I'd ever known, just like sleeping in tents. They're sleeping in tents on the road, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is so, so very different. Whoa. Yeah, but then it got old, it's just like, um, it sounds fun. At first, I learned a lot, but after three years, I felt like my learning curve like flat out. It's oh, not much like. From traveling. Yeah, I felt like so comfortable just being on the road. And say, okay, now it's time to learn something different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Just put yourself in a completely new environment. Yeah. 
So then, how did you did you just apply to go to Stanford? Yeah, I applied to Stanford and then got it. Yeah. yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, I got really lucky. It's funny. So I actually applied to Stanford before travel. I got rejected. Oh wow! And they yeah. traveled and they accepted you. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently traveling helps. Helps, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I oh, cannot so like so info info correlation from like yeah, yeah. cultural from like yeah, yeah. correlation. Zone. So then computer science, bachelor's and master's. I actually came in because I rewrote some books as a time. Oh, you were writing during the travel. I wrote. I, yeah, I published books for my travel in Vietnamese. Yes. Okay. So all four of them. No, two. Two of them. I wrote, I wrote two books when I was, Instead two other books when I was in, a co in okay. college. Um, so, uh, so, I was, so I was like, writing is kind of fun. Maybe I should become a writer. Like, so, so I was thinking of doing something like creative writing. And I, and I did took a lot of, I did take a lot of courses on it. But then I also took some CS courses, computer science, and it was really fun. So I just kept on doing it. Yeah, and <laughs> you were just like, CS is fun, it's the future, I want to be a part of it. And you just kept self, kind of like taking the courses and self-teaching yourself along the way too. Yeah, I got a lot of help. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. Just, um, it's just a possibility. It's just code, you can create things, you can make computers do things for you. It's, yeah. it's really mind-blowing. Yeah, make computers do things for you. <laughs> kind of sounds like... Uh, humans being made to do things by other forces as well yeah yeah that's a that's a that's a whole nother i trust discussion. machines more than humans also you trust machines more than humans <laughs> yeah they're predictable. predictable humans are not rational humans are not rational yeah yeah. Okay, I'm, I think I feel like I'm making a lot of controversial statements. No, I, I, I think no, these are interesting we have to, statements. We have, to, we have to be careful um, who's programming yeah. these machines, that's all. We do, because who's programming us and our behaviors and how rational? We are. are you, do you feel like you have free will? Yeah. Huh? Do you feel like you have free will? Oh, wow. Oh, I would not try to get into that, that, that debate. Um, <laughs> I asked her if you like, think she well, has free will. you just said that we, we have, we're in charge of each other. So... It's just so sad. I feel like I tried not to get into this like, existential crisis phase. <laughs> like, after reading all about like, how like, we actually, like, uh, how it says, we are actually a uh, vehicle for our genes express like, to like, yeah. themselves. And we're just yeah. like, nothing. Everything is decided like, by our genes. It's just making me feel like, then why do I exist? I try not to get into those well, kind that's, of Well, that's, 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 yeah, that's... Well, Dr. Lipton's heart. Yeah, yeah. You that know, did you, do you know about that, Doctor? There was a heart transplant, yeah. and, and the woman uh, had reoccurring nightmares about being murdered, and yeah. they said, well, whose heart is this? And it was someone that was murdered. Hmm, I think mm. I read some research about it as well. You know the book, uh, Stiff? Stiff? Yeah. What is that about? Uh, it's about her... Uh, about so it's a really great book about a cadaver like death oh. like what happened to a yeah. body after death and also they so define like what what does death mean like it's like brain dead like heart dead and um, would they, there's some what research would they about do with cadavers what would they do with them it's, it's really a fascinating book yeah uh, would so they like, just analyze them or yeah like so like cadaver cadavers are used for research like yeah. what kind of research do yeah or like what happens to the body when it's just like buried into the ground yeah and also like uh cremation and so like, yeah this is oh cool interesting you think it's like morbid but the author did amazing job and like, make it really entertaining interesting yeah. you would never expect a book like to be entertaining but yeah it's, it's, i want her to be my dinner guest and then, so then, um, okay, so here you're getting so deep into CS that you end up teaching uh, TensorFlow for deep learning research. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, this is v like, this is a big jump from the village. I know. To teaching TensorFlow. <laughs> oh my gosh, how do things like this happen in the world? It's so crazy. Okay. I think I'm glad that we live in the world that allow for, for like change like that to happen. Yeah. Um, so what ha happened is uh i didn't is i'm so like really glad that i went to stanford i think it offers a lot of academic freedom um i was looking into you know as a time tensorflow is you know what tensorflow is right google's machine learning yeah it's a tool for people uh, to train and deploy the machine learning models um so at the time it was very new and 
<laughs> documentation at the time was not very good, which is pretty true to every like engineering product. People don't spend enough time on documentation. So I wanted to learn it and I couldn't really find good resources. Mm. So I was like, that could be really cool if we have a course on it so we oh, can wow. so I can learn it together with other students. Cool. And then I talked to some professor and it's like, oh, we don't have time to like create a new course. It's like so much work. And I was like, okay, let me can you take shit? And they were like, okay. So you took out the initiative to create it. Yeah, yeah so like created a course and, and nice. taught it. Yeah. So you were just learning from the do limited amount of documentation that was made on on it, and then you would then try yeah. and figure out how to better teach it, give examples. Of yeah, I got a lot of help. I got so much help. Help, yeah. 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 You had people that helped you out. Huh? Yeah. And so you taught. How many students did you end up teaching? No, not not much. We got the student um, taught like so initial course. So through them through their own paste online stuff. No, stuff. no, it's it's a course. Nice. The first time it was offered, so it was like twenty people. So it's a it's a it's a cap. How many? Twenty. Yeah. People. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's um, still a lot of. People but then we got so much demand because the first time it was offered, we received like three hundred fifty applications for handy sport. Yeah, that's great. So like the second years, uh, they were like, let's increase the size of the course, just something bigger. But I, but I was like, I'm a full time student, I can't. Take, I can't. I cannot teach a, a big course. Yeah. So for the second year, we took like forty students, and then I got Whoa. like two uh, course staff to help me. Um, yeah. But still, like, yeah, yeah. What better way to learn than to synthesize the edge of machine learning programming and then teach that to other I, people? I think. Um, I think there's somebody. Some someone said this like, when one person teaches, two people learn. Mm, yeah, that's good. One person teaches, yeah. two people learn. So yeah, I yeah. learned I like a that. lot from it. If they have an open mind, yeah. Yeah, I think it was a learning process. Um, so that's what I was like, when I want to learn something, I should try to explain that to other people. Likewise, yeah. Yeah, so I was trying to do the same thing. It was like, I want to consolidate my knowledge in machine learning. So let's write a book on it. So that's yeah. what I'm doing right now. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's your... your uh, you're showing people how to succeed with interviewing for machine learning positions. It's not really a succeed. I feel like what I don't it? want to think of interview as a standardized test. So not a software engineering interview. You yeah. see them as like very much a standardized test. Standardized test. Yeah. And the problem with standardized tests is you get standardized answers. Oh. And you get people who like think the same way. Like oh. And you force people to prepare for that. Mm. Um, so standardized tests make standardized people. Yes. So. Damn. <laughs> yeah. So, and also like, people don't have time to prepare. I, I, I feel like I like learning, but also I, I don't like learning just so I can pass some tests. I want to learn something so I can use that in, in, in to solve problems I care about. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't like preparing for standardized software engineering tests because a lot of things I learn they're going to be of no application to me, and it give edges over people who have time to prepare. Like a lot of students, or like people who don't really have a job, and they spend a lot of time preparing. But some people actually having a job right now, they, they don't have time to like prepare. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I, I so I spend a lot. Of, I have been spending a lot of time talking to just like companies to see like how they hire people, how they come up with questions. Um, machine learning is very new in, in industry, so of course, like AI stuff has been like seventy years history. But like applying AI and machine learning in in like production in uh, to prototype is, is very new things. Yeah. And you have read about like how like forty percent of AI startups actually not doing AI at all, not doing AI. Forty percent of AI startups aren't doing AI. <laughs> yeah, they actually have humans to do it, <laughs> and they call oh. it AI startup. Whoa, it's fascinating. Um, so, so. So, for hiring, so there's so many problems that machine learning can have solved. Um, but if companies don't have people knowing how to do it, so how can I hire people? Like if you have really good in-house machine learning team, then these people can help you like evaluate the next candidate. But you don't have one, then how can you hire the first machine learning person? Um, so a lot of companies don't know how to do it. Uh, that's my from my impression, Sharon's right? Mike. There you go. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Ron. Uh, so a lot of uh, so some people don't know how to do it, and they and they try to rely on like weak signals, like whether the person went to a fancy school, whether the person like worked at a fancy company, or like had a big name professor, and so it's like there are only small group of people who fit that bill. Whereas there's so many people who like, who might be really good at it, but like we don't have a good interviewing pipeline to like correctly access ability. 
and people, the companies are afraid of hiring those people because they, they can't evaluate them. Yeah, this would be a good read. This is your upcoming book. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then, so then what, what is it like? Can we, can we get some of these examples of AI applications? You worked at a bunch of companies leading up. Um, you worked at Netflix, Primer, Bamoy. You Bamoy. helped. Is that how I say it? Baum? Baumui. Baumui. It's a news aggregator. News aggregator and yeah, it got acquired. Coke, co co is the other one. Coke, Coke. Coke, Coke. It co sounds co funny in English. Coke, Coke. It means knock, knock in Vietnamese. Knock, knock. Co People co made fun of me. They're like, there was no English speaker to like to tell you that it's a bad name when you when you name it like that. Yeah, it's it's a cool name. Vietnam's second most popular web browser, twenty million plus active users. Who would yeah. have thought? Yeah. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a side project beginning. Uh, they were first like only two engineers going on it. So at first the company had like focused on two completely different product. Uh, there were only like, two engineers going on it, and then uh, so I helped with like market research and trying to like figure out like, what people want from a browser, um, what so what features include, and then figure out as like, a go-to market uh, strategy. So I, so I have to launch it. Yeah. And then the now at Nvidia. But 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 what about all? Yeah, give us these AI applications. Yeah, that w that are were that you were working on across all these companies. So my on. team at Nvidia is a very new team. Uh, it's only about a year a year old. Um, so we we help companies bring uh, AI research to productions mm -hmm. easily. So you know, like academy academics care about very different problems. They guys really like bit benchmark. So it doesn't matter if the model is extremely complicated or like extremely costly to trade as long as it beats some benchmark. But, it, but in the real world, companies care about very different things. Because whether the, whether the model is easy to, to train, easy to deploy, quick to infer, to do inference. So we, we try to build tool, toolkit to help companies do that easily. To deploy AI yeah, train and deploy. into production. Yeah. Okay. So one, one product we have is open six to six, which is a framework to train SQL and SQL model. So first we can do like speech recognition, machine translation, sentiment analysis. Um, it's, it's based on TensorFlow. Okay. Um, and it's really helpful um, because it helps with the digital training. So you, so, you, you don't, so you want to train the models on, the, on multiple machines at the same time because it's faster. But also like training on multiple machines causes like a lot of problems. Um, so you want to like create a, a framework to make it do it without problem. And also we uh, also we allow for mixed precision training. Are you familiar with the term? Mixed? Mixed precision training. Mixed precision training. Yeah. So usually when you represent like for like FPS 32, like when you represent a float, floating uh, point number okay. with like 32 bits. Okay. So, so for example, if you have like billions of parameters, it will be extremely costly memory wise. Yeah. So if it's a way you can reduce the precision instead of using a 32 bit to present represent a number, yeah. can we use only 16 okay. bits? And you can use do only that? half the memory. How do you do that? Um, it's possible to do it, but then it also cause some like routing error because mm. like some, some values can be very tiny and when it's so tiny when you route it up to like 16 bit, it becomes zero. Okay. So we, we, we have a lot of techniques to deal with it. So basically we have um, this framework to to have you do like dual digital training and make prison training and we have like pre-built model. Um, they're pretty cool. And um, you were giving the examples of speech recognition. Yeah, we have this speech recognition system called Jasper. Yeah, okay. Um, so so it, it, is, it consists of very simple components and it has like really good performance. So I think we think it's a good baseline model for companies to like just like use in production because it doesn't require any com complex topic or like com complex techniques. So we're, we're talking about me speaking and then picking up the words via audio, yes. what I'm saying, yes. putting those in a text with mm -hmm. a certain confidence, this is the sequence of words. Yeah. And then once you have that, then there's, you want to try and prove that that's actually better than what the previous technology yeah. mm -hmm. is. So they have like standardized benchmarks for you to compare with like other models. But even though like going from like a benchmark, a like standardized like data set to real world data set is very big. It's a big step. And you're trying to beat the old models with the new... Not beat. Make, beating something makes it sound like a competition. But it is a competition. You're trying no. to be more efficient though. And this is not a competition. It's making it sound like, oh, this company has to outperform the other company and you have to be a winner. I think I like to think research is more, more like collaborative and some we we build yeah. upon some like collaborative as well. Work. Of yeah. course, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, but if everyone's going in the same standardized way of doing yeah. speech to text, then yeah, I think it's yeah. up to company to evaluate which system is best for the need because a system might be really good at like recognizing words, like general words, but the next system might be really good at recognizing like medical terms, for example. So it really depends on on the need as a company. And we have a we have another yeah example too of. And it's just not my work. It's not. It's not. The, it's not the work. But I think it's a really good example because you also ended up te using it in your class. I just show yeah. students like what at this time it was a big deal. Um, so so like, uh, I think it's the research actually from Stanford. Um, yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. So Thank so you. such a research about how this um, group of like Estaba um, and his co-author, uh, I think Brett. Um, so they use TensorFlow to uh, pre to detect classified skin cancer. Yeah. So I think like the um, problem is that it, it requires a pre like trained doctor, the ophthalmologist, a long time to, to like, detect it. Yeah, different types of cancer. Or you can run millions of examples of s uh, and train the models yeah. to detect it and then let the dermatologist know. Then. Mm, I think. I think they try the, the part of it as something that like assists the ophthalmologist in making decisions. Yeah. 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 And I think it was on par with uh, with top like dermatologists. Yeah. Yeah. It was. I think it's really cool research on the, like how using um, machine learning uh, to have this. I think another use of real machine. world application. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of people don't have access like to hospital. Like people are not close to the hospital. If there's a way they're gonna take a picture of the skin and like immediately tell them, hey, it's dangerous, and just go to the doctor right now, and then my like makes a trip like 200 miles to like some nearest hospital, for example, to get it treated. And that's what we were doing with India in India, with some eye disease, um, machine learning to help um, provide to help people like detect different um, yeah eye disease. Yeah, the me yeah the medical applications mm. are really important and. These are the these are like these. This is why we when we really talk about the different applications. I mean, medicine is such an important industry for it. Um, it seems like a lot of the the, the cutting edge tools are being used for still gaming and and uh, film and for cryptocurrency, autonomous vehicles, these types of things. I, I do think that like um, machine learning is just a tool and. There are so many things you can use the tool for. And basically, it's, it's like machining is like a hammer, and everything looks like a nail right now. Everything looks like a nail right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and maybe some things it's, real, it's good to use the hammer on, and some things it's maybe not so useful to use it on right now. Yeah, I think um, there's also a problem with hyping up like machine learning and AI, right? So a lot of companies, they were like, oh, we need to use AI for our company like and they don't even know what they use AI for this thing is they need to use AI whereas a lot of their problems can be solved with more statistical tool like uh, techniques so um, this is definitely a down side of um, of like all this hype about machine learning because an autonomous vehicle has to take in their inputs of the cameras on the environment and then have to make decisions based on that's a good application yeah and then I mean, it's still complicated to run the different c computations that that cryptocurrency needs to run. I mean, I don't know much about cryptocurrency right now, but yeah, but I think self-driving car. Yeah, yeah, applications. Self-driving car is definitely a big use of uh, machine learning. I'm so excited for it because I don't have driver license. So why didn't you get a driver's license? I'm lazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then Ubers like live like everywhere. I I don't know how to survive at Uber and Lyft anymore. I'm so dependent on technology. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. I'm so dependent on technology. I don't know how to live anymore. Well, what do we do? Like, we're going to grocery stores and not growing our own food. We're so dependent on our computers and smartphones. What would we do without them? I just think it's like all of these technologies just make the pre traditional solutions like outdated like a lot i could have like got a taxi in the past right but then all this like uber lift makes all the taxi system guide go outdated and the taxi driver are not driving taxis anymore so we can't even like i don't know it's just a vicious circle yeah the amount of applications i think that is being 
use the hammer to the nail. Hopefully some of them are maximizing our connection to nature, connection to Why do you want to connect to nature so much? Why? Yeah. Well, it's where we come from. Okay. But if it has a theory, if everything created by nature is nature, then human is product of nature and everything that we create is nature. Yeah. Yes. 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 Let me uh, put in my two cents. Yeah. You know I love the city, Alan. And mm -hmm. you're looking to go into nature, get away from the city and get closer to nature up there and... Uh, Wherever. Yeah. yeah. And um, as I'm in the city, amongst all these people, it's weird moving shrubbery. <laughs> you know? Moving trees, where nature to? The city, there's nature in this the urban jungle. Hmm. You know, <laughs> I know it's a weak case. I got a good case and a bum lawyer, but I, I love the city. You need wine, Ron. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> something say. stronger. Isn't, 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 it, isn't yeah. that though? Isn't that the case though that if we're continuing to make all of the algorithms that make our world a machine metropolis centers, then is that still connected to the origins of our essence? It feels like it's very disconnected from the origin. Okay, so we talk about origin. How far back of the origin do we want to go back? We can just think about creation and then having what we have now. Like back in the time we still had no clothes on? <laughs> Back in his house, he had no clothes on. Yeah, like yeah. no technology at all. Yeah, well, yeah, well, technology. No fire is fire technology. Creation is technology. Yeah, creation is art. It's a big, mm -hmm. big art experiment. A big tech experiment. It's happening. I feel like every generation we have this um, glorification of the past. So you look at the past through a very romantic lens. Like, oh, we are so far from the past. But then, why? <laughs> I don't know, I feel... Yeah, as yeah. long as as long as long it's being done uh, moving forward in the future in a conscious and harmonious mm -hmm. way, Yeah. if it's moving forward in a destructive, dystopic way, I don't want to move into that future. Why not? Just go forward. <laughs> Fasten your seatbelts and go. Um, I agree that's like... I, I wouldn't want... Um, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to like enter a future where there is more of like bad things than good things. Um, but even so, it's such a com complex topic because what is good and what is bad is very subjective. Oh, like sorry, yes, subjective. Yeah, yeah. If what is good for one group of people can be bad for another group yeah, of people. Yeah. Obviously, what is good for like one species maybe bad for another species like I don't know what if like yeah. machine actually eradicate human race actually really good for the planet earth then I don't know mm. like <laughs> <laughs> I'm like yeah. I, s I suffer from long stretches of existential crisis well how many ethicists and philosophers and moralists work with AI programmers mm. right now I think a lot. I think every company, a lot of companies are like hiring like AI safety researcher. And I think a lot of like, <laughs> have you read this like thread on Twitter recently? Of like how only tech VCs talk like philosophers. Mm. They were just like, yeah, tech VCs just like don't talk about tech and just talk about uh, like, okay, work hard and you, and you know, get, and, and it's gonna pay off. Like just talk about like generic life advice and Philosophy. I feel like everyone is turning into a philosopher nowadays. That's great. In is many it? ways, that's great. Yeah, because then you can go back to these questions. What is good? What is love? What is truth? These questions are really important. And if they don't have answers and we're programming some future. But the thing is, it's like we can afford to think about those questions because we don't have to worry about our basic needs, which have been taken yeah. care of by technology. You can also think about those questions and live on land and just be in that setting of your Do you think like if you're hungry 24th 
Well, if you have a rice, well, if you have rice, if you have the food on the land that you're like when you're not, I was a not kid, hungry 24/7, of course not. When I was a yeah. kid, I spent a lot of time thinking about what food I could eat once I had money. There's a lot of time on it because I worry. So my parents didn't leave me hungry, but they they, they like to give me enough food to eat. But then there was always desire to like, oh, there's really good things I want to eat, but then we cannot afford it. So I spent a lot of time thinking about like, hmm, what food would I spend my money on first? Yeah, there's a, there's a complex calculation that happens between w desiring more mm -hmm. and also realizing that you don't want to materialize yourself. You want to dematerialize yourself. Yeah. You don't want to get stuck in hedonism, just seeking pleasure. Well, you know, it's food, good food. You know, it's expensive. Mm. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of other ways to phrase the point. Yeah. Life is so complicated. Well, that's why. That's why it's no, also it's, it's also beautiful and simple too. It's both. That's many of the you know the paradox. And all right, let's do. Let's do what I think is one of the coolest things that <laughs> I've encountered. I got into much trouble because of this research. You did? You got into trouble because of yes. it? Yes. Why? Why? Wait, let's bring it up. Let's bring it up and explain it. Okay, so so this was uh, a mo little over a month ago. You did Metro Twitter, what Twitter reveals about the differences between cities and the monoculture of the Bay Area. Yeah. And, uh, okay, so then I just want to, I kind of just want to jump to it. Uh, this post consists of the following sections, data, how people in different cities describe themselves, what people talk about, unique emojis in each city, the most unique city, and a conclusion. And so basically what happened was um, you got users from the 13 areas that are listed here in US, Atlanta, Austin, the Bay Area, Boston, Chicago, DC, LA, New York City, Seattle, Melbourne, Sydney in Australia, Toronto in Canada, and London in the UK. Yeah, it's like 13 major English-speaking countries, cities. 13 major English-speaking cities. Yeah. And um, this was just the number of users and tweets for each city. But then this starts to... Like the others. Yeah. Like, so like I got also users outside those cities. And so this is like distribution of like where they come from. Where they come from, yep, okay. And then um, tweets by year in the Bay Area how people in different cities describe themselves. So it's like to the bios. So this we have bios. bios, like how people describe themselves. So Chip would parse the Twitter bios for keywords and then make word clouds of the yeah. most popular words being used. And here's something interesting. A sad thing to note is that love is prominent in all cities except Washington, DC. Some of the common words in DC bios include opinion, view, and tweet which come from disclaimers like tweets, views, opinions are my own. So if we, so be ready, if you see the word tweet, that's what that's coming <laughs> from. But how people in London describe themselves. I quite like London. View, music, founder, love, writer, world, director. So it's like there's a good combination of like founder and like tech founders and they have like- and music's the yeah. second most popular one. Yeah, yeah. and they have love, love and the view. director, writer, book, I quite like yeah. London. And then this is how people in the Bay Area describe themselves. Yeah, it's very tech oriented. So, okay, so um, I got a lot of like... At least the word love shows up. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah, I got a lot of problem for... I got into trouble for this. Why? Uh, because people were like unhappy with it. So first of... I can tell you like first of all unhappy with how I got the data. They were like, oh, you're not allowed to script people like profile or like tweet. It's like it's not... It's public information people are sensitive <laughs> it's public information and mm -hmm. and also these are and when i first reached out to you i yeah. said that we have so much useless yeah. information about there's so much noise going on in the yeah. world and to be able to run projects like these whatever percentage of companies, 40% of companies that say they do yeah. AI, they don't do AI, etc. that you, if you use the hammer for nails that aren't even meaningful, I think you're using the hammer for really meaningful things here. Because when you make a word cloud like this of how people describe themselves, it gets people to think, wow, well, why is it that we use, like there's, there's examples here that I wanna show, like people in the Bay Area describe themselves with tech, product, 
design, engineer, people. Previously, in, that's my favorite. Previously, previously Google, Google Facebook, Facebook. Oh my you know, god. LA are saying producer, actor, writer, TV. Mm-hmm. And um, this is another example where DC national reporter news policy. So, like, you subtract political. what they come on, and like, this shows the differences between two cities. So, like, yes. this city pair. That's why it says Bay Area and everyone. Yeah. And also, for those that don't know, with word clouds, the larger the word, the more frequently it shows up. The smaller the word, the less frequent, yeah. see, frequently it shows up. In Seattle's Amazon, Microsoft, Game Love. Uh, okay. And I just want to show uh, there's Atlanta. Okay, this one. In Austin, the words love, husband, mom, music, social, South by Southwest, love, whatever, life. Yeah. I just think about the word love coming up more in the Bay Area or mom or dad or family or life. You know, these types of words. You know, why is it that we're so obsessed with building things that are that are append- that are outside of us and the deeper more emotional relationships are almost put a back seat to in a sense we're like a mimetic fountain outward and a genetic sink there's like very few babies being had here worse whereas like the middle of the united states is having all the babies do you think bear is a good place to have babies it's a hard question it's not a binary answer anywhere is a good place to have babies if you got financial stability. You know, like, on teams that keep coming up when I talk to my friends, they were like, oh, I'm just going to hear for my career. But when I'm less ready to settle down to have a family, I don't want you to have a family here. It's just so comparative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, especially somewhere like yeah this it's really competitive here there's like a plus side of like oh your child would you know compete with other you know potentially uh kids that are smart in certain domains but also at the same time it's a massive the rent is very unstable here it's very high the the connection to nature can be good if you know if you maybe like live on ocean beach or if you you know actually i think California has a pretty good has pretty good access to nature. Yeah, but people are stuck. People are programmers that move here that have never been to the ocean before, and they literally live in the condos in the downtown, and they have never been to the ocean. You don't know that. I do because I used to actually talk to them, and they used to say that I haven't been there yet. It's been a year. Or people that say I've lived here four years, I've never been to Tahoe. Yeah, those you know, are just I mean, the it's people you know. Yeah, but there are also people that I know that are programmers that have been out there every month. It's totally true. They also surf, or they're programmers, they're AI, ML people, and they go and they do, um, you know, parasailing or whatever. They do so many different things. So anyway, there's tons of different uh, diverse people that do things in their own ways. But just if you're if you're not consciously using this hammer of AI and machine learning, and you're not connected to nature, you're not connected to your birthplace, you're not connected to family or friends on a deeper emotional level. Like if you don't know how to hug, right? If you, you the, and you're building AI, is there probably a problem with that? Mm. Learning how to hug? Yeah, if you, if you or th- hug is just one example. Mm. How about, do you know how to look at someone's eyes for 30 seconds? Oh my God, I want you to do it. <laughs> Yeah, because all of a sudden you'll notice that like mm-hmm. you have a deeper, more profound experience with the person. If you've never looked at someone's eyes for 30 seconds, or if you've never asked them about what their core values or their core ethics are, or if you've never asked them about you know, what their purpose is in life, or like, how they feel emotionally about who they are in this world and what their uh, partners, like all this type of stuff. It's just... We're, do we actually get into those kind of, those conversations and those deeper, more spiritual, more emotional connections to each other will, and to nature, will drastically help with the way we build our future. Okay, so how can we facilitate those kind of conversations? Well, like we were describing earlier, if there's actually um, philosophers or moralists or ethicists entering into these companies and working directly with uh, programmers, if at least if if people that are programming and designing tools also go to things that where they can practice things like emotional intelligence mm-hmm. when they can go to uh, into the forest or to the ocean when they can go and practice like circles 
of, of, of conversation where you get deeper into the emotions of each other. Yeah. I think um, there's one thing that I notice here. Is a lot of people here like in Bay Area for a career. Like I think of myself as somebody here for my career. Like if I just choose not because of my job, I'll bring not here. I'm gonna bring not be here. So a lot of people here like think of here when they're here is a fight mode on. It's like you say like go get things. They don't have time for things that like don't directly help the careers, and maybe a lot of questions about life, universe, love just don't fit in. The one thing that's really sad is that I see so many. It's not only just not it's not, didn't come from me actually. It's from like what my friends have told me. Um, they told me that like I have seen so many young, talented, smart, funny people, and they are all single. Yeah. Not only really men, but like women. Yeah. It's just like people don't have time to date. To date, they're working on their careers. Yeah, they're they're, just like they're working is like on casual. Memes. They're trying to spread ideas. Yeah, they are. They're trying to spread ideas. Yeah. And doing a date would take time away from me spreading my ideas. But other people say that if I date, then I gain a little bit more empathy and emotional yeah. intelligence, and then it helps me spread the ideas better. Man, if you have everything has a, yeah, is this. It seems like, I don't know, I was talking a lot about this, like what makes somebody a friend and what makes somebody a quietant? And it seems for me like, so I had all the conversations with like other people because everyone, I think it's just not just me. I'm not sure you feel the same way, but it's just like certain kind of like deep personal connections. A lot of things on the surface. Like you, yeah, yeah you, you meet a lot of people every day. Like, I meet yeah. a lot, it's, it's great. We have a lot of ideas like, yeah. oh, yeah, you, know, you should work on this idea. This company is doing this way, and is that friend just raise money for this? And it's really all exciting, but then it's really hard to get in deeper. Like, I want to know the vulnerable, like what what is it worried about? But don't yeah. don't talk about it. How quickly can you when you meet with someone? How quickly can you go to the depths of yeah. who they are? And yeah, because if you stay at the surface, you don't get to. People want to keep on like, hey, I'm cool. I'm making it. Um, I, I have no problems because people are afraid of like, showing the weak the weaknesses. This is not like harm them in the career. Yeah, and this is, will be good to follow up on more in another conversation together. I like I like the project Metro Tritter. I, I, I guys, do, 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 I love how you jump topic. I do, of course we move we move fast. You guys do check out the Metro Twitter um, project that Chip did. It's 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 really strong and it, it's and I and I hope this inspires more people to make projects like this. It's I think it's using um, uh, the hammer of machine learning in a. This is not really like machine learning. It's more like statistical method. Statistical method. Method. Yeah. Statistical method techniques. So um, it's. But if you yeah. do, I do urge you should be very careful with data. Like for this, like I an anonymize everything. So you I anonymize didn't, everything. Yeah. So there's no like revealing information about an entity. But if you scrape like hundreds of thousands of like users, you should be very be care very be very careful with it. And also like data is biased as well. So I think a lot of this, like people are unhappy with this. Some some people um, are unhappy with this because they think that like this data I collect, Twitter is very biased data. So maybe Twitter is biased data. It's very biased. Oh, as in like so like people in different cities might use Twitter for different purposes. First, people in Austin might be use it like just to like as a social media tool to express themselves. But people in Bay Area might use it as a networking tool. Sure, sure. So so yeah, so like data can be biased. So just keep in mind whenever you do a project this with is a fair. lot of data. Yeah. And there's okay, the dis differences with statistical methods, fair, bias with data, fair. Yeah. yeah. And safety with data. Yeah. yeah. All very fair, important things. But do projects like this because just being able to see visualized uh, data that can uh, teach us more about philosophy or ethics or the way that we actually um, can progress in a better way. I think. I think that's what this project did for for me. I think I least. learned a lot. A lot. I learned a lot from. It. Even though I got like some negative feedback, I think I learned from that feedback as well. So I think if you're like good looking into give some free time and just looking to learn or get some insight into something, I think good working with data is, is a good, good way. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you two questions on the way out. The first one is: Are we in a simulation? Hmm, de depends on what I define simulation is. What do you define it as? 
I think we are like I think one simulation in our own head. Jim, mm. I think it's something I read a long time ago about like universe is personal. Like mm. the purple might not be from the same as my purple. Like we might recognize the same thing as purple, but what do you think of as purple? Maybe different one we think. I think of as purple. Mm -hmm. So I think everything we see here, like perceive, is just written with our own personal biases. So in a way, yeah, we live in a simulation in our brain. Mm. And then what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Mm. Uh, most beautiful thing in the world. Wow. I haven't thought about it. Let's, let's see. I think it's human kindness. Mm. Strangers, the random act of kindness. Yeah. It's just making me so happy. I also cry when I see people who tried really hard and overcome. Do you ever watch things like a race and just cry at the end because you see somebody was like putting so much? I feel like when somebody put in own that they have to achieve one thing that is so important to them. I don't care what is the one thing yet. It's just so beautiful. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you, Shep. Thank okay. You. Thank you for coming on our show. You want a hug? Yes, thank you thank so you. much for coming on our show. No, oh, it was so fun. Thank you. Thank are, you are, we, are we done? I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you had a good time. Yeah, <laughs> let's close the show right now. And this is funny that we did the hug because that's another project, free hug projects around the world. Get started with those as well. Yeah, I we love just it. go and hug people. I love hugging. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. And thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, go and have more conversations with your friends, family, people online, social media, coworkers. Don't have conversations with people online. <laughs> don't, don't. Have conversations with people online. Ha, 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 have conversations uh, with people online. Do Have conversations with people in person. Yes, yes. <laughs> and also maybe share some stuff that you find important maybe online. But talk to people about the things that we talked about in today's episode. Go and share more of it around the world, everyone. And also, check out the links below, huyenchip.com, as well as her Twitter profile. Go and check those out. And thank you, Ron Vogus, for producing and directing. We greatly Thanks, appreciate Ron. it. Yay. Thanks, Ron. And also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in, the spiritual leaders. Support them. Help them grow. Support the simulation. Our links are in the Bible, below, Patreon, PayPal, cryptocurrency. Also, design merch and get paid. Go do that. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you soon.